And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who wonders if we can ever have a sane election. Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And it's so good to be back, and it's so good for Colonel Jeff and me to be back on Milleronia. You know, we love it here. We really do. It's a great island, and, well, I love it. I love the chance to have made it. And to keep making it better, and Colonel Jeff, well, loves his three special secret helicopter rides out to Milleronia, somewhere in the Pacific, but I won't tell you where. And yeah, he needs three helicopter rides to get here. And he likes that too, though. And the, as always, the music makes me feel fabulous. It, it really bucks me up. It really gives me a, a smile and a gleam in the eye. And of course, that's the Kurt Shimala Orchestra, and the Gwen Eiffel Dancers, featuring boy tenor Jim Broderick asking the musical question, Does the Electoral College have a football team? Yes, they do. But there are 270 of them, so you won't see a lot of playing time. Something to know going in. And uh, by the way, Kurt Shimala wrote in to say... He saw a 12-cup coffee percolator at Crate and Barrel, so they still make them. Thanks, Kurt. I was wondering that, and Colonel Jeff was too. I love talking about thinking about coffee and why we don't have more coffee percolators, ones with little glass tops that, well, percolate. And uh, Kurt just wrote in to say they, they, they still have them. Thanks, Kurt. I'll keep an eye out. And if I see one... I'm a gonna get it. And that's just the way that is. And, uh, you know what? Also, by the way, a quick word to Gwen Eiffel. She just passed away. And she was a very successful and beloved, uh, newscaster, journalist, anchor woman. And she was on PBS and a number of other stations. And, uh, was a young woman too. And uh, she just passed on. So we wanted to send her a tip of the hat there. And, uh, well, just, you know, thanks, thanks very much. It means a lot to have these people running our segments and running our show. And hearing that, well, we still got those coffee percolators coming somewhere. And by Amazon and PayPal and my book. Still the greatest sponsors in the world. Amazon is still the greatest company in the world. Folks, I'm telling you, they do three things no one else does. No other company does. One, order whatever you want. Whatever you want. Two, they've already got it there. They don't even have to send out for it. They don't have to call the company. They don't have to get someone who has one and buy one used. They don't have to do anything. They've got them there already just waiting for you to ask. And they have... One of those Indiana Jones warehouses that, oh, it's a mile long and a mile wide and a mile high and a mile deep. And number three, well, the best part of all, they send us a percentage of whatever you order. That's pretty good stuff that Colonel Jeff and I love that because they send us in cash, money, whatever you order, they send a percentage to us. And uh, it's it's a great company and a great deal. So you know what? You could call them. You could go on to them. You could you could send a signal to them on anything you have on your laptop, on your iPhone. But don't do that. What you do is go to our website. That's right. LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> Oh, that, that that one got me. That's the sound where you, you feel like, oh, just moving around in the chair and, and saying, I should have had the fish. But uh, you know what, though? They uh, go to our website. We have a banner that says Amazon. 
Click our banner, and we'll get you there. Click our banner and go take a nap. Joe, go sit down in your big lazy boy chair and put a magazine over your face and and take a big, beautiful nap. And we also have a banner that says PayPal. Frankly, if you enjoy my show, and why wouldn't you? And you'd like to send a few bucks to help out over here? And why wouldn't you? You can do it through PayPal. And instead of saying donate or pay what you like, I like to say buy us some drinks. Because there are different levels for drinking. There's level one through five, all the way up to... We're driving to Florida! Love that guy who screams, yes! So do that, folks. Uh, work with PayPal and look look for the PayPal banner on our websites. Remember, that's LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. <laughs> Boy, those folks aren't afraid to let you know if they're in traffic right behind you. <laughs> in any case, it means a lot here. Every little bit helps us keep the old leg lamp lit. And thank you to everyone who's contributed already. It means a lot. And thank you to everyone who's just about to contribute, too. So uh, thank you, folks. And by the way, that's also my book is available. That's right. Spoiled Rotten America, which I wrote. It And these are signed hardcover copies of my book. And they're now for sale at store.comedyfilmnerds.com. And you'll get, well, but if I do say so myself, a terrific book, and it's a funny book, and I, I loved having the deal to write it and writing it so well, and I feel very good about it. Thank you, folks. And that brings me to my favorite part of the show, the joke of the week. And the bongo drums of the week. This is a good one. Colonel Jeff and I both like this one. Nothing better than passing along a joke to you folks, telling you a joke that you can pass on to your friends and loved ones and, and feel good about it and see them laugh too. We, we, we like this one. And uh, there's a young husband who lives in the suburbs and he comes home from work every day. And, well, they're newlyweds in a sense. They're only married two or three years and he comes home every day. He loves his wife. She loves him. And they have a nice little house there for a, a newly married couple. But they also have a cat. And he hates the cat. Now, that's just the way it is. And they kept the cat because his wife had that cat when she was, well, still his girlfriend and then his fiance, And so they were going to keep that cat. If, if you know anything about marriage... Oh, they were going to keep the cat. There's that was that was not even up for discussion. That was never on the table, so to speak. But folks, one, two, three years goes by, and uh, you know what? He can't take it anymore. He doesn't like the cat. He hates the cat. And so what he does is one afternoon when his wife is off shopping, uh, he cons the cat to get in the car, and the cat jumps up into the car. And he drives the cat to the next town. And uh, he's fine with that. And he drives the cat to the next town. He opens the door and kind of uh, tosses the cat out. Slam closes the door and goes back home. And that is that. But as he's driving back home, as he, he comes into his driveway, and he sees right behind him, the cat is coming up the driveway down the sidewalk and just kind of trots up his driveway. And he's, what in the world? How did the, what? What? Well, he he doesn't know how that happened, but this hasn't changed his mind. And the next week, the next Sunday, his wife is out again with a couple of friends and they're doing something, maybe looking at some shoes or something. And he cons that cat again into the car again. And now, never mind the next town, now, he drives to the next county, which is, is way out there. And he said, you know what, this is this is enough. And same thing, he opens the door, pushes the cat out, and closes the door, drives back home. Wouldn't you know it, the second he drives in his own driveway again, 
There's the cat again, right behind him again, just coming up and trotting down the last piece of sidewalk and up their garage. And he thought, well, this is crazy. This is frankly a little nuts. And uh, you, you know you know what? And then he does it the same week, folks. Now he's more determined than ever. He takes that cat. He doesn't even con the cat into the car. His wife is off somewhere on a Sunday. He picks that cat up and tosses the cat in the car, closes the door, and now, never mind the next town, never mind the next county, he drives to the next state. He drives to the next state and gets to, well, it's a, such a rural area. And, the, you know, there are canyons and the, he just... Tosses that cat out the door, slams the door, and and you know what? Later, uh, well, a couple of hours later, he calls his wife up, and she says, "Oh, hi, honey. What's what? What's going on?" And uh, he said, "Is the cat there?" And she says, "Well, yes, actually." And he says, "Put him on the phone. I'm lost, and I need directions." <laughs> We thought that was a, a cute, cool joke and a cute, cool cat. Boy, that cat just couldn't be told no. And, uh, in fact, there was only, only someone who got lost and got tossed out of the house from that episode, and it was the guy. He didn't have his directions back. But anyway, I hope you like that joke. Pass it on if you do. And that brings me to my second favorite part of the show... The Poetry Corner. Well, that string quartet is always beautiful, and it's appropriate that they're beautiful today because this is a poem by the great William Wordsworth. And, uh... He was an Englishman, born and lived 1770 to 1850. He helped introduce Romanticism to English poetry, and he showed an affinity for nature. He became England's Poet Laureate in 1843, and he kept that role until his death in 1850. And this is not only a lovely poem, but it became more than itself, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. It's lovely, though. It's beautiful, and it's called Splendor in the Grass by William Wordsworth. What though the radiance which was once so bright be now forever taken from my sight, though nothing can bring back the hour of splendor in the grass, of glory in the flower, we will grieve not, rather find... Strength in what remains behind, in the primal sympathy, which having been must ever be, in the soothing thoughts that spring out of human suffering, in the faith that looks through death, in years that bring the philosophic mind. Isn't that lovely? William Wordsworth Splendor in the Grass, and I'll tell you how that, well, how that affects today's recording and our show. But for now, it brings me to my third favorite part of the show. MMM, Triple M, Magic Movie Moment. Well, in fact, you didn't have to wait so long because the magic movie moment I wanted to talk about today is also called Splendor in the Grass, and it's based on that Wordsworth poem. It's from 1961, and it's a terrific movie. It's very good. Directed by Elia Kazan, starring Warren Beatty, Natalie Wood, Pat Hingle. It's a wonderful cast. So many folks. And the magic movie moment, well, this is, takes place in, in Kansas in 1929. And Warren Beatty's family and his father's played by Pat Hingle. Great names to this, too, by the way. The names in the movie are, his father's name is Ace Stamper. And uh, Warren Beatty's name is Bud Stamper. 
And uh, Ace, Warren's father, has become, through the 1920s, a very rich man. He's an oil man. And in Kansas there, well, folks, in our country at that time, you could really make some money in oil. And uh, that's that's what Ace Stamper did. He owned everything, and he liked to swagger around about it. That's just the way he was. Wasn't a bad fella, but he was awfully glad he was awfully big. And uh, at that point, by the way, his son, who's in high school, falls in love with Wilma Dean Loomis. It's another great name there, I think. And and uh, she's played by Natalie Wood, who's so gorgeous and so good in this. They all are. And they don't really get their relationship. They love each other very much, but they're being told by their parents. And Natalie Wood's mother is uh, telling her that, uh, you know what, you don't fool around with boys like that, and you don't do anything sexual with boys like that. And uh, and her father and mom are happy that, that she's going out with Bud. After all, he comes from, well, the richest family in ten states. But they're told pretty clearly, do, do not do anything. And Bud is told the same thing. And they're, well, they're kind of getting frustrated by that because they love each other very much. And they're both on fire. And sure enough, all this tension and pressure leads to a point where they break up. And it's senior year in high school. And uh, Bud has applied, by his father's urgings, Bud has applied to Yale. And he gets into Yale. And the father is saying, you know what? You're too young to worry about this other stuff. Don't worry about Wilma. And just you just get to Yale. And after you graduate from Yale... Then you can worry about meeting a girl you like and maybe getting married. Maybe. But you know what, folks? What else happened in 1929? The Depression. The Depression hits, and boy, Ace Stamper loses every penny he had. Every penny, though. And things are now pretty tense. They have no money. Nobody has anything. Actually, oddly enough... Well, the only people who have anything are Natalie Wood's parents because they took all their money out of the bank to pay for her in an asylum. She was so upset with having to break up with Bud. She's now in an asylum. She hasn't done anything wrong, but, well, they actually have all their money waiting to keep her in there as long as she needs to be. And Pat Hengel decides to try and make his son Bud feel better at that point, he takes him on a trip to New York City. Now, that's a pretty big deal trip. So it's still in, uh, well, the end after the after the Depression hits, he takes him to New York, and they get rooms at a fancy hotel in Manhattan there. And, well, Ace takes his son out. They put tuxedos on, and they go out. They go a-hopping and a-dancing. Now, uh, liquor was still illegal, but, oh, you could go to all sorts of fancy clubs that that had it on the side, and that put it in coffee cups, oddly enough, and that had dancing girls. And this is a magic movie moment for me. Pat Hingle, who's, well, on his way to being crushed. He's lost every penny he had, but he wants to teach his son what's important in life. And he has one of the dancing girls, one of the chorus girls, come over to their table and... She kind of resembles Natalie Wood in a, in a way. She has, well, brownish black hair, and she has a smile, and so she's not, and she's certainly a, a, an attractive young woman, but it's not Natalie Wood. And this is the theme that Ace wanted to teach his son Bud. He talks to Bud as she comes over, and he says, "Now I want you to look." I want you to look at her. Look, look right at her now. Look right at her. See? It's the same thing, bud. They're the same thing. You don't have to worry about Wilma anymore because this one is the same as she is. Don't ever forget that. They're all the same. And, well, he gets that girl to come up to Bud's room that night 
And what happens or doesn't happen there doesn't really matter now, because what touched me about that moment is, and Colonel Jeff was wondering too, did men think that at the time? Did fathers, and whether they were wealthy or working for a living, did they tell their sons, don't get too excited about someone because it's the same thing. They're all the same. And he didn't mean that in a mean way. He thought he was really giving some philosophy to his son, Bud. But folks, even as it happens, even as that scene happens, what makes it magical is that you and I as the audience and even Bud as the character, you can see it in Warren Beatty, we know that's not true. It's not true at all. And Bud knows in the movie, and you and I know in real life, no, it's not the same at all. And we want him to be back with Natalie Wood, and we want her to be back with him. But poor Pat Hingle, poor Ace Stamper, he's lost everything, and it doesn't get better for him, and he winds up killing himself. But you know what, folks? The lesson, the magic movie moment, in Splendor in the Grass, is that you and I and Bud Stamper know it's not the same at all. So where should we put our affection and our loyalty? And I bring that up because, well, just a few days ago, it was Veterans Day, which, as you may know, was originally called Armistice Day. And that was the end of of World War I. It took several years before the treaty was, well, signed on that railroad car in France. But you know what? That's a very important day. That was a, that was a terrible war. And there was so many, oh, so many young men killed and wounded and just shattered by poison gas in so many ways. And Veterans Day, also when they finally realized, you know, both sides, look, let's just, well, the the Germans lost and their alliance lost. But when everyone finally said, you know what, that's enough already. And they decided, well, why was it November 11th? I, I like this. I've always been touched by this. They decided that all fighting would stop and the ceasefire would begin on the 11th minute of the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. And that was, of course, well, November 11th. And uh, it was originally called Armistice Day and then became, well, more of a regular holiday and for all veterans. And it's something we don't think about a lot. It's something we don't. As you know, it just, well, it just goes by. And I'm not even sure there are sales for it anymore. Hey, get a new mattress on Veterans Day. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. I wasn't making fun of that. But I don't even know if we remember it that way. And I was away that day. I was flying that day. And I want to tell you about that in a minute. But it made me think that, well, Veterans Day comes at a perfect time this year after our election. You've heard about that. <laughs> you've you've read about that, and you were following it like me, even when you didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to, but boy, that election, you know, it finally hit me, folks. And maybe it's hit you now, too, just a little bit afterward. You know, that was not just a crazy and offensive election. It was deeply hurtful, and a lot of people are shattered. They're just broken apart. I'm not talking about who won and who lost. I, I think we finally began to realize, maybe you did too, this was a terrible election and staffed by awful people in all sorts of ways. And uh, you know what? I don't know how. My wife was is still very upset. She was a big supporter of Hillary Clinton's, and she... She's been kind of crushed that she thinks that she's now that she's not. She still uh, thinks that uh, a lot of women are just crushed by this, that 
She doesn't feel she has any e equality in the society. And I'll tell you what, folks, I think a lot of people feel that in the aftermath of this election. Not not just the women in it, not about women, but about, well, about everything. And I don't know what to say about that past. I've never spoken about politics, as you know. I never quite saw the point. And I made a quick mention a few weeks ago, I think, of, well, is this just me or is, it, is everyone crazy in this thing? But you know what? I think I think maybe they were. I went uh, on election night, that Tuesday night, uh, with my wife and uh, several of her friends uh, went to, they got a theater at a local hotel, and they were going to show the election stuff coming in on the screen there. And these are all good folks, and I, I like them as people very much and as friends. And you know what? They were, well, they were falling apart. And I mean that because they were. They were they were hugging each other, they were crying, and there's been a lot of upset since then. And well not just on the you know all this, not just on the internet, not just on T V, but phew, on on shows I I can I still can't take these shows that all the news shows start the day off with oh you wanna say Stop it already. Please just stop it. But I don't even know what to say in return. Stop it and why? I, and I, I don't know how. I, I, uh, I think maybe I'm upset too because, and I'm not even sure why. Is it because we were all, well, treated like dirt? Were we? And were we all just kind of, herded into areas to go, no, now all of you, just go over here now. Now come over here, now go over there. Now look at this, here's some, here's some information you don't have yet. Were these things all facts on either side, on both sides? Were they at all true? Were they just said by people just to create some kind of image? I don't know, folks. Maybe you don't either. Maybe this is the right time for you also to think about what in the world just happened. I certainly hope that, uh, well, it, it works out, that something works out, that we don't all get just, well, herded up and <laughs> sent away somewhere. And I, uh, but I'm just telling you, I don't think, I don't think that's going to happen. But folks, it just made me think because I then left on Veterans Day. And my wife, God bless her, was very upset, but very upset. And uh, there are a lot of people out there, as you know, who are very upset. I don't mean that just someone lost or someone won, but that they feel they've been treated like trash. And I left on Veterans Day to go work. Well, it was a job this weekend, a this past weekend, a very good job. It was cross-country, a lot of money, and it was first-class treatment, first-class hotel, first-class theater in the hotel, a major organization for a first-class cause. I had that job set for that night, and I went down at 3 o'clock to meet the folks, the sound man, and uh, there are two very nice young women who had set up the whole show, were producing, running the whole thing, and they specifically asked for me. And that's that's also, that's very flattering. And, well, I tanked it. That's the truth. I did not do the job I love to do. I love to be an entertainer, whether it's acting or writing or stand-up. And, well... This one was stand-up in their theater there and for a good cause and a bunch of people who had given a lot of money to it. And I did a bad job, and that's the truth. I was out of focus, ineffective, and tired. And the audience was also unfocused and annoyed because I was unfocused and annoyed. And I did not recover 
from whatever it is was hitting me in the head. And these two young women were very nice and everyone there involved was very nice. And I came back into the room to shave, shower and get dressed and did the show. But it stunk. And I'm not being over overly harsh on myself. I just couldn't get my engine on and the, I stunk and the show stunk. That never, never happens. How bad was it? They wanted the money back. Monday morning they called my manager and they didn't like what I did. And they're not wrong. They, had, they were paying me a lot of money for this. And I, I said that to my manager Monday morning. I said, you know what? Because he... He agreed, you know. He said, if they, these are folks, they they really wanted you to be there. They, they loved you. And you know what? It wasn't something to love. Well, that, that's, that's enough saying about that. But if we're all honest, I don't think this election was just, oh, uh, you, no, not so bad and not so bad at all. There's not uh, too much hate. Yeah, I think there was. I think it affects all of us in its way. There are things we love, you and I, that get better or get worse, and we help them get better or get worse. So I'll tell you what, folks. Yes, I did a bad show there, and I didn't. I'm not the kind to fall apart, and I'm not the kind to sit in the corner and cry. I know what I have to do now, and I know what I want to do, and I know what I will do, and how I write my shows, and how I write my scripts, and how I prepare my acting, and how I do everything. And I want to do that, and I will do that. And I thought, Phew, boy, when you don't do that, that's when you get unhappy. That's how you don't fulfill everything you're made to be. And you know what? I am going to do that. And I thought, this all ties together, too. The, the, sure, the way I performed was not what I want to be, and it's not what I will be. And... The election we just had is not what I want it to be, and I, I, I'm not going to accept that in the future. I don't know how, but I won't. And I'll tell you also, when a good day comes along, like Veterans Day, like Armistice Day, I think I and you ought to take a moment and stand there and look up and say, thank you. Thank you all, you fellas who fought and died. And you know what, folks? I know that's the way to grow. I'm not surprised it all came together at the same time, in my life and in yours. So I took a step back, folks, in my life and realized this is not where I want all these things to be. And even more important than that, folks, I realized for the first time fully, I'm responsible. I'm in control. So are you. We want to change the way we are. We want to change the way we perform, do our work, live with our families, live with our, our business partners. Guess whose responsibility that is? Yours and mine. And we can do it. I can do it and you can do it and I'm going to do it. Whew. It's a wild period though, wasn't it? That election is still crazy. I think they were all out of their minds. Well, I'll tell you what I know, folks. I know I can do better. And I know you can do better. I know we can all do better. And we don't have to have this crazy stuff happen again. Homer is Homer and Pluto is a planet. So remember, folks, as always, if you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a home to come back to and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. We'll see you here next time.